Any other kids heading to children's church? Any adults want to go to children's church? Anybody? All right. Hey, stay, stay put. Anyway, yeah, the amazing song. Uh, I used to mention this from time to time. If my daughter Michelle would sing, and then I would have to preach after her. That's just a hard act to follow. That's a hard act to follow, but really that's just... The reason that's hard to follow is because that's just a, that's a spirit of worship. That was, that was an act of worship, so thank you. And um, Johnny, the little, uh, you know, the little combodulation we had, that's just being led by the Spirit, brother. It's just being led by the Spirit. It's all good. <laughs> so hey, welcome to United Christian Church, and welcome as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I will tell you today, you're going to hear this now, you're going to hear it later. The only reason you're here... It's because Jesus raised from the dead. You're, I'm going to prove that to you this morning, so stick with me. Now, I can't believe that I'm going to tackle this, but I'm going to. Who's familiar with the hymn, I Love to Tell the Story? Anybody know that song? All right, now sing it loud with me. Ready? You got the words up there? Oh, yeah. Ready? I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory. To tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I'm coming after Dave Cornell. All right. So this morning, I'm going to tell a story. And who doesn't like a good story, right? Right? We like to hear stories. We like to tell stories. Give me a story that's going to bring back fond memories. Give me a story about my grandpa Bud. Give me a story that's going to make me tear up. Give me a story that's going to make me burst into laughter where I can't catch my breath. Give me those stories. Because stories stir emotions, they teach us, and stories can actually persuade us. Now, if you're going to tell me a story, make it intriguing, keep me on the edge of my seat, and let me give an example of this. Last month, I attended a, a preaching conference in Indy, Indianapolis, and I attended a seminar, an afternoon seminar, on preaching and teaching biblical stories. It was actually how to be a really good storyteller. The class was taught by a professor from Kentucky, and his name is Billy Strothers. Now, when you hear the name Billy Strothers, what do you think a guy like Billy Strothers looks like? Well, exactly what you would imagine. Billy is bald. Billy's got that big, thick goatee. Billy's got that gruff southern Kentuckian accent. And he looked like he probably wrestled a bit in his day. That's Billy. And what happened that afternoon was that he, he told us a very interesting story. And on that afternoon, he had 50 to 60 preachers crammed in this little conference room. And we were on the edge of our seats listening to Billy Strothers tell us this story. Goldie Locks and the Three Bears. And he just made it intriguing. I'm like, what's going to happen next? And so I'm going to try and dazzle you this morning with the greatest story that's ever been told. I'm going to tell you the story of Jesus and His love. And as Dave mentioned, to get to the tomb, you've got to get to Friday. You've got to go back to Friday. I tell you what, at times, and I love to preach, but at times you don't, you don't need to hear a sermon. At times you don't need to hear a teaching. At times you just need to hear a story. You need to be reminded of your faith. Because sadly, sometimes stories taught or told in the past are quickly forgotten. We had bad memories. I do know that the story of the resurrection and of the crucifixion, they're traditionally held up for what this time frame? We always have it on Easter Sunday and, and Palm Sunday, right? But for me, I like to think outside the box. Why don't we preach or teach or tell the story in the middle of July? Why not? Because the resurrection is why we're here. C.S. Lewis stated this for Christians, we have to be continually reminded of what we believe in. Neither the belief of Christian doctrine or any Christian doctrine will remain alive in your, remain alive in your mind. It must be fed. Because do not most people, including Christians, simply forget things and then drift away from those things? Yes. Have you ever drifted away from Christ? That happens. Maybe you need to hear the story today. And so this morning we're going to piece together three what I call short stories into one big story of love. And we're going to travel down three roads. Dave just sang of the first road, the Via Dolorosa. It's now called the, the way of suffering, the way of pain. 
Two roads follow. The way of death and the way of power. And we need to mimic the early church, the Acts 2 church, because they never ever stopped telling the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, even beyond all doctrinal teaching of the Apostle Paul, those two standards and pillars, it fueled the early church. The resurrection of Jesus should fuel this church. And so this morning I'm praying and hoping that you all receive some spiritual fuel for your spiritual life as we watch Jesus literally walk down three roads. And what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to take His eyesight, what He's thinking, what He's seeing. I'm going to make it personal. So let's begin. The Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow. I've mentioned before a few months ago that there is a fifth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah chapter 53. The gospel in its entirety is in Isaiah chapter 53. If you don't believe me, check it out. We see the life of Christ, the suffering of Christ. We see the resurrection of Jesus. They're all written by Isaiah 700 years before He will arrive on this earth. Let me read the prophecy of sorrow. This is the prophecy. He was despised and rejected by mankind. That's the Messiah. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. Wow. What adjectives. Jesus. Despised, rejected, suffering, painful, crushing, and an offering for sin. Wow. The Jews weren't expecting that type of Messiah. Jesus will have suffered much before he takes one step down the Via Della Rosa. So I want to give you a timeline of what Good Friday looked like for Jesus through his eyes and possibly from his heart as he walks down the road of sorrow. So here we go. From the eyes of Jesus as Good Friday begins. And these are approximate times. At 2 a.m., Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I imagine Him saying this. I look up into the darkness and I see lanterns and torches. I see spears and clubs. I see this mob coming towards me. And as, as I look, slithering through the crowd, I see Judas appear. And Judas approaches me. And Judas calls me Rabbi. And then he kisses my cheek. And I pray, Father, stay with me. Father, stay with me. It has begun. And so we see at two in the morning, Judas arrives under the, under the cover of night. He has Roman soldiers. He has Jewish temple police with him. And they are there to arrest Jesus for, remember, 30 pieces of silver. And in that day, 30 pieces of silver might accumulate to a month's wages. So I let's say... For four to five thousand dollars, Judas pays off the arrest of Jesus. Now, to arrest someone in those days, like today, you had to have a probable cause to arrest someone. They had some legality in the Jewish system, and Jesus has committed a crime. The Jewish leaders have a probable cause because they've heard Jesus proclaim that he is the Son of God. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, My name is I am, and they heard that. Without a flinch, without a hesitation, Jesus proclaimed to everyone, I am the Son of God. And so the, the order is issued, arrest that man. Arrest the blasphemer. Four in the morning. Guys, most of us aren't awake by then. Jesus has been up quite a while now. He's going to be judged. <laughs> Think about that. The Creator is going to be judged by the creation. I enter a, court, a gated courtyard that I'm not familiar with. I look, and everyone in the room is wearing robes, and they have tassels flowing down their robes. And I stare at my shackles on my hands and my feet. It's dark. It's cold. I am alone. I've been abandoned. Father, Father, give me strength. Father, give me strength. 
This trial against Jesus, it's a sham, it's illegal, it's being performed at night, it's being performed before the Sabbath, that's illegal, there are no witnesses, the Pharisees and Sadducees will hire people out, they'll go on the streets at four in the morning knocking on doors, come and witness against Jesus. That's the order issued by those who claim to live by the letter of the law. It's a sham. It is at this trial that the physical violence placed against the body of Jesus will begin. They will strike Him again and again at His trial. Illegal. 6 a.m. Jesus is now brought before Pontius Pilate. The Jews have no power to kill anyone. They're under Roman authority. So Pilate, they go to Pilate to seek the death sentence. Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate. It is early in the morning. The sun has just risen. The birds are chirping. I am not hungry, but I am thirsty, Father. I am led into Pilate's headquarters, and I glance down the corridor, and I see Pilate appear, and he's walking towards me. I know of Pilate. I know of his violence. I know he's a cruel man. Father, I love you. Father, I love you. And Pilate will declare three times on that day the innocence of Jesus with this phrase, I find no basis for a charge against him. He is innocent. Try him by your own laws. But he will fold before the pressure and the bribery of the Jewish leadership. Listen, if you don't deal with him, a riot's going to happen, and that's going to get back to Caesar. You better do something. And Pilate will fold. And what he will do first, he will try to appease the crowds, please the people with a Roman flogging. Appease the people. How often have I, how often have you been people pleasers rather than God pleasers. We've all been tempted to please people rather than God, but to put ourselves first rather than God. There's this lengthy discussion in in Pilate's office, and they talk about kingdoms, and they talk about truth, what is truth. And then Pilate issues the order. You know why? To appease the crowds. Actually, he does this to hopefully release Jesus And so then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged or flogged. Now it's around 7 in the morning, and Jesus is led to the whipping post. I see the whipping post and the shackles dangling. Do you have an image of that? There's the whipping post. That's pretty accurate. I see the dried blood stains on the post and on the ground. The muscled soldiers look eager for the task. They are trained for this. And they bind me up to the post. And I glance to the right and I see the flagrum. I can hear the metal and the bone of the pottery on the flagrum jingling in the breeze as the soldiers taunt and tease me with it. And I am crying out, Father, grant me strength. Father, grant me strength. I have a flagrum with me that Mr. Gurgany made me. This is a pretty accurate replica of what a Roman flagrum would look like. I'll let you get a bird's eye view. Many times it was called a cat of nine tails. There are nine straps of leather on this flagrum, and it's interwoven with pieces of metal. The flagrum that was used against the body of Jesus would have had these metal pieces. They would have had bone and pottery, and on the tips there would have been round little BBs for ultimate punishment. Many times the flagrum was used to extract information and then they were released, bloodied. And then on other occasions, the flagrum was used to soften a prisoner up before his crucifixion that he might die sooner. This was the instrument that was used upon the body of Christ. You notice how short this handle is? That would inform me that whoever is performing this punishment is up close and personal with Jesus. After the multiple strikes against the body of Christ, this legionnaire, this soldier, would have tasted the blood of Jesus literally on his lips, covered in it. 
Pilate thinking a bloodied and now scourged Jesus. He's now wearing a crown of thorns. He's now wearing a purple robe and he's brought back to Pilate. And Pilate these, utters these most famous words as he stands Jesus before the Jewish crowd and he says, Behold the man! Behold the king! Almost in a form of mockery. Look at the man. Look at the king. He's nothing now. Let him go. But the crowd will not have it. The crowd that once said, Hosanna, 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 bless is he who, he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's now one word. Crucify! Crucify him! And so Pilate will give the orders. And before he gives the orders, set this here, Pilate will do this. Remember this? I'm going to do it. His blood is on your hands. And so Pilate wipes his hands clean of what's about to take place and he gives the order, crucify. Crucify this rabbi. Eight in the morning, Jesus is forced to carry the cross to Golgotha. I would imagine these words. I am so weak. The wooden beam on my back digs into my open wounds. As I walk down the Via Dolorosa, I see women and children weeping for me. As I stumble and get up, as I stumble, as I get up, Father, bless them. Bless those who are weeping for me, God. Father, bless those who love me. And so Jesus takes his first steps down the Via Dolorosa. This walk is about 600 meters. It's close to half a mile. And it's an incline walk to Golgotha on a hill far away. No, it's actually not that far away. Pilate can watch the whole episode from his office. If you were to walk 600 meters or half a mile today, it might take you 10 minutes. This walk for Jesus will take over an hour. It's a struggle. The cross beam itself weighs around 100 to 150 pounds placed on his back. And so I'll ask you today, imagine carrying the cross beam of that size, the cross beam, put it on your back, put it this way, this way. I don't care how you carry it, but get out in the parking lot and carry the cross down to milk and honey. And oh, by the way, make sure it's at an incline. Can you do it? A lot of you can. But let me give you a, a little extra ump that's placed on Jesus. By the way, you have not eaten food or drank water for 12 hours. And oh, by the way, you have suffered significant blood loss. Some of the blood loss and punishment that Jesus received would have killed a normal guy. Now, we don't know the yardage marker when this event takes place. Is it 200 meters, 300 meters, 400 meters? But somewhere on the Via Della Rosa, Jesus can't carry the cross anymore. Father, I can't make it. Father, I can't make it. I'm too weak. My body can't make it. Father, help me. You know what the Father says to the Son? I know, Son. I know, Son. I love you. I love you. And I'm sending someone to help you. Son, only a little longer, and you will be with me, and I with you. I'm sending help. And He sends help in the form of a Jewish man from North Africa. Simon of Cyrene. Yes, the man of color. Matthew 27, 32. As they were going out on the Via Della Rosa, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. I think you have an image of that as well. Do we have that one? There's Jesus, and now Simon of Cyrene is helping Jesus carry the cross, and eventually Simon will carry the entire cross for him. What a privilege, what an honor to carry the cross of Christ and have His blood on your body. We read they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. I have an image of that. That was taken about 120 years ago, 100 years ago or so. That is in Jerusalem, and that is Golgotha. You see the eye sockets. You see where the nose probably is broken off. You can see a mouth, and you see that brow at the top. 
That is Golgotha. That top of that hill is where your Savior died for you. The Via Della Rosa is a road highlighted with pain. Pain, pain, pain. And guess what? The day's not over. A whole new type of pain awaits Jesus, and it is a Roman crucifixion. Nine in the morning, Jesus is nailed to the cross. The soldiers throw me to the ground upon the cross. I look to my right, and I see a soldier place a large nail at the base of my hand. Our eyes meet. He smirks. He laughs. And then I hear the hammer raised and the hammer strike the nail. Father, the pain. Father, take away the pain. Father, I long to be with You. Father, give me strength. I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes right now. And I'm looking. Close your eyes and place yourself self on Golgotha, top of the hill, along with Mary, Mary Magdalene, and John, and the soldiers, and the Pharisees. You're on the hill, and this is what you will hear. Mm. Crucified. Crucified for your sins. <clears throat> the nails were driven right through his wrist. Sometimes we think it's through the palm of his hand. Actually, it was driven through the wrist. In the palm of the hand, after so long, that nail would have ripped right through his hand. So they went through the list where there's some bone and cartilage where he will hang and not fall off. One foot on top of another. They nailed the feet into the cross. And really what a Roman crucifixion did, guys, is very simple. It highlighted the victim's guilt, their shame, their humiliation, their weakness, their crime, and really highlighted the power of Rome. You see this man? You want this? You obey us. Isaiah wrote about the body of Christ as it hung on the cross. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. His death was disturbing. One glance at the body of Christ on the cross, and you would have looked away. If you had your little ones with you, you would shield their eyes from that seed. It's that gruesome. He will hang in that state for six hours until blood loss, dehydration, congestive heart failure, and really, as Johnny mentioned, what really took his life was asphyxiation. He couldn't breathe out. You know, if you've ever had a, a little panic attack and you're, oh my gosh, I can't breathe, Lord, help me breathe. That's what Jesus is going through. He can't get his breath right. And at the last moment, he will say, it is finished. It is finished. I think I have one more image of that one too. Yes. The death on the cross has now paid for the sins of the world. You know, we... Uh, <clears throat> oh, Sailor's not in here. Okay. Good. <laughs> Friday night, Chauncey and I and Sailor watched The Passion of the Christ with Sailor. And we had to talk about this and pray about that. Should a seven and a half year old see this movie? Because it's graphic. And we said yes. And so we're sitting in the big double recliner. I'm sitting here, and Sailor's sitting there. And we are covered up in a blanket. And when we get to the flogging thing, I take the blanket and I say, just put this over your face for a while. And so I wouldn't allow her to watch the flogging. I thought, I thought it was too graphic. So when the flogging was over, we took down the blanket and we watched the rest of the movie. And we got, we got to the scene. This is my favorite scene of the Passion of the Christ because I believe with all my heart Jesus so loved his mother, and his mother so loved him. It's that scene where Jesus has fallen again, and he's having trouble getting up, and Mother Mary sees her son. And she has this flashback where five-year-old Jesus falls in the dirt and scrapes his knees, and she cares for him, and she's going to care for her adult son. That's still my baby. I cried then, I cry now. 
It just shows so much love between a mother and a son. And I started to cry. And Sailor wiped my tears away. I said, Dad, it's okay. Daddy, it's okay. It's going to work out. (laughs) But as we watched them take Jesus to the cross and that road to to the cross as they beat him and spit on him and mocked him and the way they treated Jesus even at the, at the crucifixion site. It was inhumane. And Sailor said to me with childlike faith and childlike truth, he didn't deserve that. Daddy, Jesus didn't deserve that. Those other guys deserve that. That's truth. And I had to tell her, listen, When Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins, your sins and my sins, guess what else? When he died on that cross, he was dying for those people that spit on him and beat him and mocked him and made fun of him. He even asked his Father to forgive them. That's how great the love of Jesus is, that he would love and ask forgiveness for those who spit upon him. And I'm hoping that she understands what Christ-like love is now. If you take one thing away from the service, please don't forget this, that Jesus loves you. You must remember that Jesus suffered greatly for you because He greatly loves you. Never forget the suffering love of Jesus for you. Now let's move on to the via mortis. The way of death. Now we're going to get literal. The body of Jesus is now limp. The chin of Jesus now rests upon His chest. And what's happening now, his nailed wrist, they are bearing the full brunt of his entire body weight. It was his legs as he raised up and down to breathe. They're they're jello now. He's dead. And so all of his 175 pounds is resting on his nail-scarred wrist. Someone has to deal with his death, and someone has to deal with the dead body now. Enter two Pharisees. Imagine that. Not as disciples, Pharisees. Do you see how the life of Jesus can change people? Two Pharisees, we know them as secret disciples. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Joseph, let's talk about Joseph. He was a, it said he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea, sorry Ed, I always pick on you. But Joseph of Arimathea is an Ed Taylor or Roger Freeman. He's a high-ranking official or elder in the church, as is Nicodemus. And oh, by the way, Joseph is wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. Nicodemus was also a member of the Sanhedrin, and he is also called a silent disciple, a secret disciple. Do you know that Nicodemus, the Pharisee, was the first to hear this phrase, you must be born again? Do you know that the only person to hear Jesus Christ utter these words, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, was guess who? A member of the tribe that hated Him. Yeah, Nicodemus is the only one to hear John 3.16. Ever heard about God's grace? There it is. Now more than likely, Nicodemus and Joseph... There's no doubt. They, have, they witnessed the suffering and the flogging for a time. I don't think they could handle all of it, so they left. And they're surely at Golgotha to watch a crucifixion, not in a joyful state, but in a horrified state. Guys, listen, when the Sanhedrin voted whether he's guilty of blasphemy, Joseph and Nicodemus, they cast a no vote. They cast a no vote. They're just going to stand up. They're going to with they're going to exclaim their belief at the vote. But Good Friday was too much to bear for Joseph and Nicodemus. And so they make this decision, particularly Joseph of Arimathea, that we're going to care for the lifeless body of Jesus. And you know what happened when they decided? Because Joseph goes to Pilate and says, I want to take down the body. I want to care for the body. You know what that did? Joseph and Nicodemus came out of the closet. They came out of secret discipleship to bold faith public. We love Jesus and we're following Him. Let me ask you today, is your Christianity, is your faith in Christ, is it public or is it in a closet? Do you proclaim it or do you hide it? 
If someone asks you what you believe about Jesus, do you say, yeah, I believe. Or do you say, no, I believe in Jesus and I know Him and He knows me. I know Him. Nicodemus and Joseph were not afraid to say, I know Jesus and we're with Him. Here's how that took place. John 19, 38-40. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly... Guys, don't be secret disciples. Because he feared the Jewish leaders, and with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body. And that would mean, actually, he took the body down, and then he took it to the tomb. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. That's all in John chapter 3. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and in strips of linen, and this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. So what does that look like? So, a normal crucifixion, not during Passover. Here's what takes place. The custom of the Romans of that time, they would normally leave the bodies on the cross. And here's why. The birds will pick at it. The maggots will eat the body away. And rodents and other things will just... They'll take care of the body. And if it takes too long, they'll just take it off and throw it in a dump heap. That's how it usually played out. You know why? The Romans want everybody to know, listen, we're in power. We have power over you. You better listen to us or you're going to have maggots eating your body. So that's how it usually played out. But not during Passover week. Somehow at times... The Roman Empire had this little bit of compassion, if that's what it is. It was more to appease people. But at this time, during the Passover, they granted a proper burial for the family and friends of Jesus. And it was granted to Joseph of Arimathea. Now, have you ever considered this? We're all very familiar with the the image of Jesus crucified on a cross. Have you ever considered how Jesus was taken down from the cross because somebody had to take his dead body down? And we read here that Joseph and Nicodemus, they take the body down. They choose first to remove the body from the cross and then they have to hastily prepare it for burial because a Jewish custom taught that no one could touch a dead body. You could not have a burial after sundown. So they got about two hours to get his body down hastily prepare it, and get it into the tomb. Jesus, I'm going to guess, I don't know, 5'9", 175. Average guy. He's a dead corpse. He's covered with dried blood, fresh blood, oozing blood. The, the wound in his sign is probably still oozing from the spear. He has gaping wounds. Very evident. Guess what? These guys have to not only take the body down, <clears throat> they had to remove all the dirt and debris from his body. That is a daunting task for guess who? Two teachers of the law, two elders, who have probably, and oh by the way, they're probably wearing robes and tassels. They have never probably touched a dead body or been near a dead body, for it would make them unclean. So you know what Joseph and Nicodemus have become? They have literally become the hands-on servants of the Messiah. They are now the morticians for the Messiah. Can you imagine that? More than likely, two ladders were taken to the cross. I'm going to say a a, a pry bar to pry the bent nail out and a hammer. And lots of linen. Here's how it played out. One man would get on the back side of the cross, climb up the ladder, bend out the, the, the nails, and hammer them out. Before that happens, the man on the front ladder would take straps of, straps of linen underneath the armpits of Jesus, underneath his legs, lasso it around the cross beam so there's leverage, and when he's ready, out go the nails, and down comes Jesus. Did you know there's a, a legend, probably within the Catholic Church, but I believe it's true, there's a legend that the Roman centurion that looked over the crucifixion, his name is Abinadar, that he was on the last rung of the ladder as he helped Jesus down. Guys, Jesus changes everything. I believe with all my heart, a Roman centurion gave his life to Christ on the day that he died. 
So they've got him on the ground. The nails would have fallen out easily. You know why? As he's going up and down, you know what happens if you move around and move around? These holes have been reamed out. They're jagged. So those nails just pop right out of his wrist. Gruesome. So Jesus, his body's on the ground. Nicodemus and Joseph will quickly prepare the body the best they know how. Imagine what they see. Imagine what they look upon, upon this dead, limp body. His eyes of compassion are closed. There's no words of truth or no words of love coming from his mouth. Broken pieces of thorn. They probably pull out of his scalp, pull out of his hair. The dirt, the debris. His lips are cracked and dried. The puncture wounds, they can't miss the puncture wounds. And then they flip him over. And I believe that the ladies there, if Mary Magdalene and some of the women are there, which they probably are, can you imagine the corporate gasp when they see his back? Oh my gosh, no. His back is one large, bloody, ripped up, shredded mess. And I believe the question of the day at Golgotha is, how could a human being inflict this type of pain upon another human being? Nicodemus, tell me, how can we be that evil? And so Nicodemus and Joseph, their, their emotions are ramped up. They're full of sorrow. They're full of sadness. They're full of anxiety. We've got to get this done. And they wrap the body in linen of the one that they have just placed their faith in, of the one they've now become public that we believe in Jesus. And they will carry him, literally, Nicodemus probably grabbing the legs, Joseph at the head, and they will carry him a few hundred feet to the tomb, which is owned by Joseph of Arimathea. Because the prophecy said that the Messiah would be buried with the rich in his death. And so he was. A rich man buried Jesus. The prophecies are all over the Bible. I imagine Nicodemus and Joseph having this conversation about his death and possible resurrection because Jesus spoke of it. Joseph, we know that Jesus spoke of this supposed third day resurrection. Do you believe this? And Joseph, well, I hope so. Well, Nick, do you believe this? Well, he raised Lazarus after four days. He can surely raise himself for three days, can't he? And so I believe they still had a glimmer of hope that he would come back to life. But nobody really knew, did they? Did anybody have that type of faith yet? Guys, you've got to think about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus raised in a religious culture, raised in a, re a religion of law. And now look what they're doing, man. They're getting bloody. They're getting unclean and they don't care. You know why? Guys, listen up. Time with Jesus can transform a person. If you're not spending daily time with Jesus, I'm going to petition you Please make that effort. He will transform you. These two have gone from a worship of a religion to a worship of a Savior. Now we're going to end this with the Via Imperium. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And they're going to prepare the body again, add more spices. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I think that's funny. You know, this earthly power that we think we all have is nothing compared to the heavenly powers. The angel probably just moved the stone like that. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow, and the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I mentioned this at the sunrise, I'll mention it again because I like humor. Anybody familiar with fainting goats? Right? The goats that just fall over and faint. These brave, bold, stout, muscular Roman soldiers fell over like fainting goats at the side at the, at the side of the angel of God. Now the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said he would rise. Jesus physically walked out of the grave. 
Jesus unwrapped himself. Nobody took off his linens. He did it himself. And sometimes we make the assumption that the stone was rolled away for Jesus to get out. No. Jesus could have walked through the stone. Jesus could have rolled the stone away, walked out, and set it back in place. We don't know exactly how he got out. But the reason the stone was rolled away was not for Jesus to get out. The stone was rolled away so that you could get in. So that you could see the risen Messiah. So that you could believe in Him. So that Peter and John, when they ran there, they could see just linen, no body. Do you believe He's alive? Do you believe He rose from the dead? Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The resurrection is part of your salvation plan. The resurrection fueled Mary Magdalene to become one of the greatest disciples of all time. It fueled the disciples to become apostles. It fueled the Acts church to grow from 120 to 30,000 in about a year. Does the resurrection still fuel you? Or do you need to feel good to be fueled? Without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no church. I am positive about that. And let me offer you my proof. The disciples spent what? Three years with Jesus, right? They saw hundreds of miracles. They saw Him walk on water, right? They saw Him heal the man that was lowered through the roof on a mat. The guy got up and walked. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He drove out demons. He calmed seas. Lazarus walked out of a tomb. They saw all that, and then they heard Jesus proclaim this. I'm the Son of God. I am God. They heard Him proclaim that He was God. And then He told them, guys, you read the New Testament, Jesus literally in clear black and white Aramaic said, I'm going to be killed And three days later, I'm going to come back to life. He told that to their face three times. Though if I told you on such and such a date, uh, I'm going to put it way in the future, let's say I'm going to die on this date, and three days later, God's going to raise me from the dead. Now, you might not believe that, but if you saw me perform hundreds of miracles, you're going to write that down on the calendar. He said he's going to raise from the dead on this day. Guys, that proclamation of his resurrection, those disciples remembered that. That prediction, they had not forgotten. So here's the question. What if the stone was not rolled away? What if when Mary Magdalene came to the stone, the stone was still there and the soldiers were still watching guard? What if Jesus doesn't appear in the upper room on the first Sunday? What if He doesn't appear on the following Sunday? What if He doesn't appear on the next Sunday? How long did the disciples wait for Jesus if He doesn't rise from the dead? If they don't see the proof of what he claimed, that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, the conclusion would be after, after a month, he's not really the Messiah. He's a great guy and he performed great miracles, but he's not God. You can't kill God. So he's not the Son of God. So here's what happens, guys. If Jesus does not walk out of the tomb and appear to the disciples, you will have seven fishermen who were on the Sea of Galilee a month later fishing for fish. You'll have one tax collector who has reapplied for his old job and is at the tax collecting booth trying to make all the money he can. You'll have one zealot who's back in cohorts to kill every Roman that he can. That's what would have happened. But that's not how it played out. Because Jesus did walk out of the tomb and they continued to follow him to their deaths. Acts 4.33, we read this. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It's that powerful. He rose from the dead. Praise man, come on up. Jane, bring praise man up. You want to know what else is proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Every believer. Every believer in the sanctuary today, you are living proof that Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb. 
Number one, because you believe that. Number two, you know why? Because that story was told over and over and over. And it was written down in this book over and over and over. We have 6,000 copies of the New Testament proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the story is not over. There is another resurrection awaiting to take place. Christ will raise up His followers. First those who have fallen asleep and those who are still alive. There is a resurrection that's going to take place. Let me read it to you. This is be encouraging words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If I can get to it. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Those of you who have loved ones who have fallen asleep in Christ, you have hope. Here's why. For we believe that Jesus died and then rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's Word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the resurrected Jesus Christ. Thank you. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That is the hope of the resurrection. And as they get ready to sing this song, guys, I'm going to tell you straight up, no grave has power over Jesus and no grave has power over His followers. 